Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Hey Amen. Good morning. What? Well, as Edward said, you're here on a good day uh, because you get to hear uh, the great Joe Fields. Right, Joe? <laughs> Yeah, so hang on before we get started. Joe, when that clock says 10.15, we need to what be done. What does that mean? We need to be done. Okay? What does that mean? All right, it means you like to talk a lot, and we need to be done at 10.15. All right, I got you. Okay, all right. So, uh, But I'm wearing Edward's mic, so that gives me a little more, right? No. Take it, buddy. Okay, so um, hopefully with you being here this morning, we're going to answer a, a, a question you may have asked uh, many times in your life, and that is, why do we even bother to go to church? And a friend of mine, his grandmother used to pick him up for church, and he asked that one day, he said, Grandma, why do we go to church? And she said, so you won't do dope. <laughs> and so I guess if you don't do dope, you don't need to go to church, right? So, uh, but that's not really the reason. Most of what we've taken uh, here this morning, what we're going to look at is our statements, our strategy, and our structure. But... Uh, Kind of one of the, the uh, add-on features to it is that it will actually explain why we do church. That church is not just a cultural thing. It's not something we just do out of habit or because mom and dad said we had to or we'd go to hell. The church actually has a lot of purpose to it. And so that's what uh, we're going to see this morning as we look at uh, what this church, how this church is put together, how this church works. It will uh, hopefully help you to assimilate very quickly to the church here at Summit Heights uh, so that you can find your place in this family. And by doing that, hopefully uh, you're watching this morning as you look at all the things that we're involved in and how we're structured, and you can spot the place that you feel like you can best serve uh, the family of God uh, here in Hawkins, America. So we're going to start, first of all, with our statements. We'll take a look at what are, what are the statements we make as a church. And one of the things you'll discover about the Summit Heights Church is we're not kind of your average mom and dad's church. We don't have a big list of things to do and don't do at Summit Heights. Like, we don't care if you wear blue jeans, and we don't care if you comb your hair, if you have any. Uh, we just uh, want you to come praise God, love God, and serve God uh, with us so we don't have a lot of the cultural or customary traditions that a lot of times went along with church. And so we just want you to come as you are and then let God start working uh, with you from there. Our statements as a church are more based on just who Jesus is. We want to be the church where you find out what are the claims of Jesus and how do you measure those claims in your life. So uh, our most fundamental statement is as simple as this. Acts 2.36 says that this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And that's kind of where we start. Because a lot of people we run into, uh, they think the word Christ is maybe Jesus' last name. And that's really not the case. Uh, Jesus being the Christ and the Lord are two very specific things that are involved in you building a relationship with Jesus. So first of all, he's described as Jesus the Christ. And most of us, if we were to find that, we would easily understand that he is the Messiah. He's the promised one from the Old Testament who would come. He is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham that God would bless the whole earth and save the earth through a Messiah. And that is Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus is the only way to go to heaven. And we don't apologize for that belief because that is from God. 
We also believe that Jesus is a deliverer, that he's not just some religious savior, but he actually delivers us from many of the oppressive things about life. And so in that way, Jesus is our Christ, and we want to claim that because when we claim that, then we begin building our relationship with God. But as in any relationship, it cannot be one-sided. It can't be just what God does for us. In any good, healthy relationship, according to my wife, I have to give back. And that's where Jesus the Lord comes in. Because the Lordship of Christ involves our willingness to make Jesus our master. Our willingness to obey him. Our willingness to make him our king and our ruler. And so simply put, Jesus our Lord means he says we do. We are the kingdom of God. We are God's subjects. We are God's servants. And so when God speaks, especially through Jesus, we feel a commitment to obey what God has said. So we don't apologize for using the word obey. It's not that we're trying to work our way to heaven. It's that in this relationship with God, we have also made Jesus not only our deliverer, but he is the master of our life. And we want to order our lives in such a way that it reflects the mastery of God in our lives. And by doing that, we bring honor to God. And it's a response. It's an act of worship. And, right. th you know, that statement is more of a theological statement, almost like people say, well, what do you believe? Well, we believe that Jesus is both Christ and Lord. A mission statement that we have, you know, the reason that this particular body exists is found underneath there. We exist to connect people to God and others. And the bottom line is relationship. And so when you talk about statements, you have that statement of beliefs about Jesus being both Christ and Lord. But then you have a statement of why we exist. And everything that you're going to hear this this morning, all of the ministries that are going to be showcased, all of the ministry environments that we offer, everything we do is for this purpose right here in this second statement. Everything we do, we do because we want to connect people to a loving God and we want to connect people to other people. And the bottom line is relationship. We want people in relationship with Jesus Christ and we want people in relationship with other people. Right. With that being said, you know, how do we connect people to God? How do we connect people to other people? And that leads us into our strategy. What, what have we done? If you ever wonder, you know, what, what elders do? What the elders of the church do is that we... People are still trying to figure out what I do. Well, I am too. Okay. But uh, what we do as elders in the church is we actually oversee the work of the church in terms of three main concepts. So when we look at our strategy, uh, all I really care about a church doing is winning people to God and connecting them to other people, training them to walk in a relationship with God and how to walk in a relationship with other people, and then sending them out. Win, train, send is actually a fulfillment of what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize uh, those and then teach them to obey everything. Send them out to win other people. So really the focus of what a church ought to be doing and centered around is not how big is our parking lot or do our lights look good in the, in the uh, worship area. Th that's really not what we focus on as elders. What we focus on is are we doing the work that Jesus did of winning people to God and then connecting them to other believers? Are we training them to mature in that and then sending them out to serve and be involved with other people? And when it's, you talk about when train send, because I can see some light bulbs or some, some anxiety in some of you, like send me where, send me to Africa. Well, maybe, but highly doubtful for most of us in this room. For most of us in this room, and there are a few of us in this room that are going to be trained and they're going to be sent off to Haiti or Honduras or maybe to another part of this country to start another church. But for most of us, I would say 99% of us, you're going to be sent to one of the ministry environments that we already offer in this church and in our community. And when we begin to break those down here in just a little bit, I want you to think about that in the terms of when trained sin. What is God training me to do? Is he sending me to work with youth? Is he sending me to work in uh, Love One? Is he sending me to work with the worship team? Is he sending me to work in children's ministry? Okay, does that make sense? And so just file that away. Yeah. So in the when trained sin concept, one of the things we decided to focus on as a church is how 
we're relating to the next generation. Because realistically, if we're going to pass the torch from generation to generation in our faith, at some point we have to be very intentional about how we do that. And so as a church, we decided to focus uh, a, a good portion of our attention on the next generation. So if you're 50 years old or up, you're part of the last generation. And I get to say this because I is one. We old people. And so uh, we've had our generations to do church the way we were going to do church and, and have the music we wanted and all that kind of stuff. So really, at about 50 years old, I kind of shifted a gear and said, really, it's not about me winning my generation anymore, although I still want to do that, and I'm still reaching out to the people that are my age or above. But for the most part, our attention is, as a church is focused on our next generation. And one of the reasons that we really want to do that is I would really like to help the next generation not have to endure some of the baggage in life that I had to endure because I didn't become a Christian until I was 21 years old. And there, there were a lot of things that I had to overcome in becoming a Christian that late in life. So imagine if you can win people in those formative years before they make life-altering mistakes. That's huge. And so we decided, okay, let's put our emphasis and our, 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 uh, the, the main things we do as a church, let's put that on the next generation. So um, there may be things that when you come to Summit, the music may be a little raw, may be a little loud, may not be what you're used to, you know, with the old rugged cross harmonizing uh, going on. But that's okay. It, it, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different from maybe the way our generation did it. And we want to encourage that because it sort of is the way next generation, them young whippersnappers, it's sort of the way they like it. And, and I've gotten where I like it. So, you know, we, we just as, one, as the last generation have to make some adjustments in how we are going to see church being passed on to the next generation. And, we're, and the elders in this church are with that. We, we like the concept. We want our young people connected and involved in the concept of church because church really is not a cultural thing. It's actually comes from the book of Ephesians, that God put the church here, wants us getting together, wants us worshiping together, wants us working on a mission together. So we hope by doing that to attract and draw the next generation. I mean, I know you're good. I'm just curious why you use the 50 illustration when you're clearly like 65 or 70. Because, because you're officially old at 50. Okay. Okay. So you're almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> That's, but at 50, you get to rest. <laughs> All right, go to the next. <laughs> All right, so the next thing, you actually don't, but it's fun to think you might. Um, another thing we believe very strongly in is paid staff. Uh, I, I support very strongly the idea that a church needs a paid staff. Uh, Coca-Cola got around the world with a paid staff. McDonald's got around the world with a paid staff. And what it affords us is the ability to have people thinking about God's work 24-7. They don't have to worry about the stresses of trying to make a living in a secular world. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll, it can be done, but that's just not the way uh, we want to do it. We want to do uh, life with people that are involved full-time in ministry and give all their best time and all their best attention. The way we structure our ministry team here is that um, as a church, we have ministry leaders that, and some of our positions are paid, some of them are volunteer, uh, but we want our ministry people not to stress or worry about uh, their financial health as well. So I'll tell you this, that uh, Edward and Jake and others that we pay to be on staff full-time, they don't just sit back and determine how much money they want or how much they, they get. Uh, we sit down and we study uh, structural models of what preachers with certain experience and education ought to be paid and things like that. And so their salaries are structured based on what we believe is fair and right and in keeping with our community and, and the people around us. So um, I want you to, to have full faith that when you give with your contribution, it's not going to Edward's bank account. And then he decides how much he keeps or really how much he gives Danielle. 
uh, that's really not the way it works. It, it works by the elder team deciding together uh, what we will pay our staff and who will be hired next. And our, all of our hiring is done as a team. Uh, our latest hiring was our youth minister, David Bright. We all got together. We interviewed several youth ministers, and we all um, agreed that David was the, the best for the job and is. He's a, he's a great guy. I'm, I'm really glad we, we uh, hired David. So uh, that's kind of in the strategy of how we're going after our next generation. We want to invest even in paid full-time staff to reach our next generation. One of our big strategies is small groups, and you're going to hear a lot about that today. We're in, in fact, some of you have already seen the tables that we've set out. We're relaunching our small groups ministry, and I'll really dive into that specifically here in a minute. But when you go back to our mission statement, connecting people to God and others, that is done best in a small group environment. Um, this is great. I mean, having people come in and, and, and be in the chairs is great. But for people to really grow and to really grow in Christ and really be trained to be sent out, you need to be in a small group. And so as we move forward through this today, you're going to hear more and more about small groups. Right. So I want to look at uh, the next slide is about uh, the structure of the church. How are we structured as a church uh, to do all this? And the first thing you'll see there is that we're an elder-led church. There are seven elders in this church. And the way decisions are made in this church is that any of Let's say somebody has an idea of a ministry environment that they want to create. That is put before the uh, eldership group, the seven of us, and we discuss how it fits into our strategy. If it fits into the strategy, it's got a chance. If it, if it really doesn't fit our strategy or what we're trying to accomplish next, uh, it may get tabled for a while until we get the right people or the right timing comes to put it in place. Uh, but in other words, Edward... Uh, it's not a pastor-led church. We, Edward's a great pastor, great friend, uh, very trustworthy. But it's th with the elders in place, it allows a broader range of people with a, a broader range of views as opposed to one guy just kind of taking over things and, and just um, uh, pushing his, his way on other people. So, uh, have, and, and all of our elders are different. It's actually kind of interesting when we talk about this quite a bit. Some of our elders are really good at teaching. Some of our elders are much better one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I mean, the, the dynamic in our eldership, it, I, I love it. I, I like our elders' meetings. They're not your typical, you know, what color should the stripes on the parking lot be type meetings. We typically, Yellow. we get together and we, uh, most of us go, I don't care. Uh, but, uh, but we talk about people's needs, how to reach them best, um, how to, to serve our community uh, visiting the hospitals or uh, consoling or helping those in grief or even reaching out to and helping those uh, who are in need. So that consumes our elders' meetings, and I love that. I don't like meetings to begin with, but our elders' meetings are much more focused on people and ministry, and, and for that reason, I love them, and I like the fact that we're an elder-led church. Also, as, as an elder, it is our responsibility to make sure the church is healthy. How do you know if a church is healthy? Well, that, that, if, you're, if you're sitting in the audience and you're thinking about, man, one day I, I might want to be an elder, and I hope you are because we do need more men to step up and lead and to really uh, help us to oversee the health of a church. The things that we're about to get into next really talk a lot about wh what is the, um, the health chart that you would look at to know, do we have a healthy church or is our church on the brink of some disaster that might uh, hurt us all uh, in some way? So as an elder, that really is our responsibility to watch over the health of the church and the health of the ministry staff uh, to make sure spiritually we are uh, headed in the direction that God uh, would want us to walk in. Yeah, and so what you're about to see uh, is the in, uh, unveiling of our structure and the six things that we do well um, more specifically, the six ministry slash mission environments that we put a lot of resources into, we put a lot of effort into, and we'll break that down in a minute, but I just want to go over them real quick. Number one is our Sunday morning environment, what you're experiencing right now. From the time you get into the parking lot and you grab a donut and a cup of coffee and somebody greets you and hands you a bulletin to the worship 
uh, to the tech, to the, the slides and, and the lights and the, and the music and the teaching, uh, the communion that, that we uh, partake in each and every Sunday, baptisms uh, by immersion that we get to experience uh, every so often. Well, actually, more often than not, to be honest with you. Everything that, that you're experiencing here, we call our Sunday morning uh, worship and teaching environment. Number two is our youth ministry. We really put an emphasis on youth ministry, like Joe said, in the next generation. And so the students have their own night of worship on Wednesday nights where they uh, worship, do teaching, small groups. Uh, they have a meal. The third one is our children's ministry environment. It's going on right now in the back. Same deal. Worship, teaching, small groups. Um, Groups, our small groups environment that we'll talk about in a minute. It's number four. Number five, recovery. Celebrate recovery. We offer on Thursday nights. We have men and women that go to, uh, to different things like Crucible and Women Revealed and things of that nature for recovery. Um, anything really, um, I was thinking about this actually this morning going over these notes. All of us are in recovery because we had a sin problem that only Jesus could fix and then our sanctification as we walk with Christ is nothing more than a recovery process. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be a church that focuses on that. And that's not just drugs and alcohol. That's a, that could be anything, overeating, depression, anxiety, uh, sexual abuse, codependency. That, that thing can go on and on and on. And then our, our sixth ministry mission environment is Love One. That is the benevolence slash ministry mission arm of the church where we are actually in the community, meeting needs financially, feeding people, um, doing a whole bunch of stuff. And I'll, I'll break that down here in just a minute. Yeah, let's, let's take a look at the blueprint of the church. Um, and by the way, the, on, on this concept is not something that most people get exposed to in the churches where they attend in terms of, of how do you know if you have a healthy church. So we decided to throw this in because we really, in order to get us all on the same page and looking at the same things, we decided to uh, write down what, what we believe a healthy church is and then how you would know a healthy church. And, we, and this bicycle wheel actually illustrates it um, I'm sure you've ridden as a kid on a bicycle before that had a real shaky tire or didn't run true. And, and uh, what you may not have realized is that the spokes on a bicycle wheel are designed to be tightened. And you go out on the rim on the outside and you tighten the screws. And if you over tighten one side and you leave the other side too loose, you're going to get a lot of vibration. And so you, you go to the other side and you tighten it. And so what bicycle people that repair them do is they make sure each of the spokes are equally tightened. And that process is called dynamic tension. It's what makes things run smooth. So in the church, we strive for dynamic tension. In other words, we want the balance to be there in the church. And the spokes, as it were are the five things that you see identified here. These things are spelled out in the book of Ephesians as God's intention for the church. And so that's what we've done. We've taken God's intention for the church and we put them in dynamic tension as if to say, let's make sure that we are growing in a balanced and harmonious way with what God wants the church to be. So, for instance, you'll notice membership out on the uh, outside there. Uh, if we were a church just interested in numbers, let's just get a bunch of people in here. And we didn't care much about what we taught or, you know, it was basically just, let's just try to gather up a bunch of people. You might end up with a church that's very big, but extremely shallow and very worldly. We could end up back in Corinth again. And we don't want to do that. So, what would help that? Well that we not only look at what our membership is, but what is the maturity of our membership. And so across from that, we would want to tighten up on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So we make sure we're not Corinth as it was, but the church as God intended. Now at the core of it in the middle is what's called magnify God or worship God. And worship is more than just what we do in here. Worship is a lifestyle. According to Romans 12, uh, we worship God by the way we live. And so everything in our life, if you, if you have one goal in life as a Christian, that goal is to bring glory and honor to God. That is at the center core of everything you do and everything you get involved in. One of the things that really helped me as a young Christian was if I started to get involved in something, 
I learned to ask the question, how does this make God look good? Because if I get caught at it, and somebody goes, yeah, don't you go to that church down there? I have just brought shame both to God and to my church. So I learned that magnifying God really as a motivator, if it's at the core of your life, you don't need a whole lot of do's and don'ts. You just ask yourself the question, how would that make God look good? One of the reasons our young people are checking out on church is because they see people who have been, quote, Christians for years, and it hasn't made any difference. In other words, it hasn't glorified God or magnified God for us to go to church for years and not have the transformation into the maturity of being like Jesus Christ. So as an eldership, we look at this and we watch how this is going. We watch our mission environment. Obviously, Jesus came with a mission. So if we're going to imitate Jesus, we need to live life with a mission. Obviously, Jesus started a ministry. So we want to have a ministry that's highly reflective of the very uh, ministry that Jesus had when he walked on this earth. So at the core of what we're doing, we are trying to bring glory to God. And that's what we call you two as disciples of Jesus, to bring glory and honor to to God. That, that's really our goal in life. So what does it look like? If you look at the next slide, we've got it broken down for you. So now we're going to marry this, the blueprint of the six things that we do well, and we're going to marry it with what Joe just talked about. Everything we do is to magnify God, but we want to have tension and we want to be balanced in how we mature our people. And, and the d acrostic that you see there, uh, we're trying to make disciples of Jesus. You know, what does it look like for a disciple of Jesus to die to self? to imitate Jesus, to serve others, to be committed in love, to have impacting faith, to, to walk in the presence of the Holy Spirit, to have lasting fruit, and to have an enduring faith, all right? So we want to be teaching people, and we want people growing in those areas. Sometimes Edward will do a, a sermon series uh, about death to self, or we may spend some time on the presence of the Holy Spirit, but through the course of about a year or two, you're going to see us balanced in that area as we teach. Our small groups will probably be studying something that falls in one of those eight areas as we're trying to mature people in Christ. Uh, when you go over to membership, uh, you know, I'm going to make a statement at the end, end, of, end of today that really talks about what a member looks like. But at the end of the day, somebody that is sold out to the cause of a church is going to be connected with other groups of people that are members of the same church. And that's why we're relaunching our small group ministry today. And our small group ministries encompass a lot of stuff from re-engage uh, marriage enrichment ministries to prayer ministries, our prayer team that meets up here on Monday mornings and worships and prays. We've got women's groups. We've got men's groups. We've got uh, community groups that are just, you know, couples that from different parts of our community, you know, Holly, some that meet at Holly Lake, some that meet in Hawkins, uh, you know, some that meet up here at the church. They're all on display and you're going to have an opportunity to, to get connected today as a matter of fact. And then you look at ministry mission and that's where these six environments that I went over a while ago come in. When you look at the serving areas and the ministry and the mission opportunities that we have, there's ways for you to get plugged in uh, everywhere. I mean, there really is. I mean, you, all the way through our teaching environment, being on the tech team, uh, singing, playing an instrument, if you do that well, uh, to being a prayer warrior, uh, to, you know, first impressions team, handing out bulletins, getting communion set up, working the info desk. Uh, there is a place for you in our sun, it's, that Sunday morning environment is not just the, the Danielle, Edward, and Jake show. I mean, there's a place for each and every one of you to plug in and serve on Sunday morning for the purpose of reaching people, connecting people to God, and connecting people to others. Our small group ministry I talked about, our children's environment, there is a need for you in children's ministry, and I'm going to go ahead and call out the men. There is a need for men in children's ministry. Our young boys and our young teens need to see godly men. Did you hear me? Yes. All right. There is a need for that. There's a need in preschool. There is a need, a real ministry need for some of us to go back in the nursery and hold crying babies. 
so moms and dads can get just an hour to an hour and a half in here without having to worry about that crying baby. That is a ministry need. There's need in youth ministry on Wednesday night. Same, we need men and women, all right? Even if you can't teach, even if you can't, just to be a presence in that room. There's needs in our recovery ministry uh, at Celebrate Recovery. There are needs in our Love One ministry, all the way from packing a backpack to donating food to, to giving financially to showing up on Friday. Um, and when you look at these uh, six things that we do, ministry and mission go together. Because all of our ministry environments accomplish our mission. And when we're on mission, we're actually doing ministry in these environments. Love One is our main missions environment. It's our local and regional mission environment. We feed kids in the school districts. We meet financial needs. Um, we have a ministry uh, that meets up here on Friday mornings. Times to be determined because it's always different. But it's usually around 10, 11 o'clock that I can't even describe it. I mean, if I told you they, that, that they unloaded a food truck, that's not, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's like, I think it's like church, like the Acts 242 church. Because you show up, you're with ministries from all over East Texas. There's about, I don't know, 20, 30 of them. You unload trailers of food, you sort food, you unload trucks of meat, you sort meat. And then at the end, um, yeah, I'm going to pick on you, Jim and Denise, at the end, Jim brings a, brings a sermon, brings a message. And so you're having church. So you're in a ministry environment, in a mission environment, but you're also maturing. It really encompasses everything that we do. And all of our ministry environments are created to do that. We want to connect people to God and we want to connect people to other. And so when we look at these six things, why do we call it the six things we do well? Why do we call it the six ministry environments? Because we do those really, really well. And we don't want to do 25 things average. We want to do the six things that we know God has put us in this community to do. When we started this church, there were already churches here, folks. <laughs> Still are. What was God calling this church to do? Well, he was calling us to create a Sunday morning environment where people could come in and investigate the claims of Christ. People that didn't want to be here. That they could come in, feel safe, feel comfortable to investigate the claims of Christ. Feel comfortable in their unbelief. Feel comfortable in their doubts. And just see what this Jesus thing really is. We wanted people to grow. We wanted small group environments where people could grow. Those of us that know about Jesus Christ and Jesus the Lord. That we could be matured, not just sitting here on a Sunday morning, but being connected in small groups for the purpose of growing. We wanted to create a dynamic children's ministry where kids could come instead of sitting, and there's nothing wrong with this, and I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not calling any other churches out. But we didn't want kids sitting in here doodling while somebody's preaching a message that's way over their head, we wanted kids in their own environment learning about the love of God at their level. We wanted to create a dynamic youth ministry where kids could go from school and from basketball practice straight here into an environment where they get fed physically. I mean, we feed them food, and then they get fed spiritually. We wanted to create a recovery environment because we believe everybody's in recovery. But we also know that there's people that really need extreme recovery, that are chemically addicted, that are in emotional pain, that have been sexually abused, that are codependent and think that they can fix everybody else and, and they end up ruining their own lives because I are one of those people. Uh, people that have severe wounds that they need to deal with. People that have been hurt, angry at God, angry at themselves, angry at their spouses. They need an environment where they can come and let all of that out. I've heard from too many people that have said that I can never say what Danielle says from the state. If I even mention the anxiety or the depression that's going on in my life, my church would disown me. That's not who we want to be. We wanted to create an environment where you could feel safe in that and find healing. And then we wanted to create an environment where we don't just gather in here on Sunday mornings, that we're actually out in our community. One of the things I love about this church, one of the things I love about Love One, 
Um, all the stuff that comes in this church and then goes out into the community and into the region um, is great. But we have so many people. We have people in this church that um, substitute teach at the school, um, that, that are employed at the school, um, that coach Little League, uh, that work in after-school programs like mentorship or, or volunteer, drive buses, and you know why they do that? Well, because they want a job. Man, most of them, they do that because that's their mission field. That's their ministry. That's how they love on people. That is an extension of love one. And I just love it. And so mm -hmm. if you come to us with a great idea, like Joe said, we're going to think about it, but we're going to run it through this filter of strategy and structure. And, we, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if, it's, if, if, if we're going to implement something at the risk of damaging one of these six ministry environments that we do really well, we may not and we probably won't do it, you know? But we might. And so just keep that in mind because this is the groove. This is the niche. This is the lane we believe God has us in. Let me, as a point of emphasis, uh, have you look at under maturing, uh, the first concept of maturing is uh, death to self. Our biggest issue as humans is selfishness. At the, at the core of everything we are, every one of us is selfish. We, I, I evaluate most of what happens in my life based on how it affects me. And so... When you look at who Jesus was, Jesus laid down his life for the honor of God and for the good of others. That is at the core of being a disciple of Jesus. So if you made a decision to be a disciple of Jesus, what you bought into was, I'm going to take my selfishness and I'm going to lay it aside. Here's why that's important. Because if the first one doesn't happen in the Lordship of Christ, if you don't die to self... None of these other things are going to happen. That's, right. That's why it's at the top. Because the fact of the matter is, Jesus the Christ changes how you relate to God. Jesus the Lord changes your life. Yes. So if you bought into Jesus the Christ and you believe it's a ticket to heaven but you left off Jesus the Lord and you didn't die to self, if you're wondering why your life isn't changing, that's it right there. Do a little more work on what it means to make Jesus the Lord of your life and I think you'll see the transformation things happening as you implement the other concepts of what it means to imitate mm -hmm. Jesus. Now the last one as we wind up uh, kind of this whole thing, you, you get to uh, see as we'll go to the last slide You'll get to see kind of the whole thing. This is the big general view of Summit Heights Church. This is how and why we are here to do church. We're here to win, train, and then send out others to imitate uh, the example of Jesus. Uh, so these are the things that we encourage you to do. Um, I, I'm grateful to be able to work with you as an elder. I, I love this church. I love the emphasis that this church has um, I love the way that the people of this church have always rallied to whatever need this community had. And I just want to really uh, brag on you as a church that it is truly a joy to work with you as we magnify, glorify, and bring honor to God in this community. Yeah. So I, I, in closing, I want to reiterate a couple of things. We exist to connect people to God and others. And the bottom line is relationship. Everything we do is for that purpose. A church is not measured by the number of people that it seats, but the number of people that it sends out. And sends out, listen to me, is literally sending out into those ministry mission environments to serve. Sending men and women into youth ministry, children's ministry, love one, small groups, recovery ministry, first impressions, worship team, things of that nature. We are nothing without volunteers. That's right. Nothing. Nothing absolutely nothing. And we believe God has called us to win people to Christ, train them, and then answer their own God calling or wherever God is sending them to volunteer. And it's an honor and it's a privilege to be able to do that. And so in closing, somebody asked me 
or somebody asked us years ago, what does a member at Summit Heights look like? And back in Edward's uh, brasher days, um, before he calmed down a little bit, he would always tell people, he well, if you want to be a member, act like one. I mean, that was like, if mem- members act like members, that's what they look at. And so we had to kind of set Edward down. So we need to craft that a little bit, you know, all right. And this is what we came up with because we believe money and time, your time, follow mission, all right? I could look at your calendar and I could look at your checkbook and I can tell you what you're passionate about. And so members at Summit Heights are people who partner with us to create fund and serve in our ministry environments for the purpose of connecting people to God and others. Help us create, be visionaries, all right? This church is not gonna look like this five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. What is it gonna look like? Help us figure that out. How are we gonna reach teenagers 10 years from now when technology evolves and times change? Help us figure that out, all right? Give If you believe in what God's doing here, give. Give of your finances, but give of your time as well because we need you to serve. We can't create ministry environments and then just have them empty. We need people in those ministry environments. We're gonna be there with you. So partner with us. Help us connect people to God and others. Help us in the mission, amen? So we're gonna close like this. Gonna bring the band back. We're going to have a time of response. This is the part, if you're visiting with us today, we close every service this way. Uh, We partake of communion, um, open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. We have two tables in the front and we have two tables in the back. And we're going to have a time of response. I'm also going to ask Joe, myself, if Edward's in the room, uh, Joanne and Mike Clark from our prayer ministry and any other grace place or prayer encouragers, we're going to be up front because we are going to have a time of response. And this is what we're going to respond to today. You say, well, how do you respond to membership? Are you calling us to be members today? No, this is what God has laid on my heart specifically, okay? Because I am one of these people left to myself, I will isolate. I will stay home in my chair with my cup of coffee and I will just be to myself. And if I do that long enough, I will die on the vine, okay? Some of you want to run from community, And you don't know why that is, okay? And so I want to encourage you. I have already spent time in prayer for you this morning that God would move your heart and want to be open to the idea of connecting in a small group or connecting in a ministry or connecting in one of these mission fields. And you just need the strength and the courage and the prayer to do it. So we're going to be available to pray for you today. And then Danielle and them will come back. So we'll respond by taking communion. If you want prayer, we'll be up here for that. Um, and then Danielle will close us out. And then after we're done, we're going to turn the lights up. And as you're dismissed this morning, I want you to stop at one of these tables. We have women's ministry over here, serving opportunities over here, and then all of our re-engage and small group and prayer ministries over here. And I challenge you to get connected. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, you're good. Thank you for Jesus, God, as we respond this morning again, just as I prayed this morning. I pray for people like me. I'm picking on myself. I pray for people like me that even now I want to say amen and then go back in my office and isolate. But God, that you would move us into community. God, you created us for relationship and you left a void in our heart that only you can fill. But even when you fill that void, God, you've created us to be with other believers and other people on the journey. So God, move us into community. Let today not be a presentation, but let today be a message that you've spoken to our hearts. Number one, about who you are. Number two, about the plan and purpose you have for us. I thank you for each and every person that sits here today. And I pray that as Danielle begins to sing and the band begins to play, that we would not just move in a ritual style, but that we would move in worship. So, Father, we honor you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen, and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day, and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.